All right, I'm I'm a big believer of of trying to stick to the timeline. So uh, let's start off this this webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us today. It's it's nice seeing such a big um, turnout. I really appreciate your time. So today we're actually going to chat with Norman Colling from Regcom about um, sending registered documents via email and SMS. Now. Um, Norman's the director at Regcom, and we've got him here to spend some time with us. Welcome, Norman. Thank you for your time. Good to have you here. Um, I think, first of all, tell us a little bit more about yourself and about Regcom and what you guys do and what you offer to our industry. Well, there. Thank you, Rob, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, there are a couple of familiar names here um, and then a couple that we don't know either. So it, it is good to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to chat. Um, what do we do? Well, there's an interesting question, Rob. Um, we started this business back in uh, towards the end of 2015 um, with a sole purpose of trying to improve very specific uh, methods of communication. So I come from a, a banking background. My partners uh, come from a telecoms background. And, be and between the, those two kind of backgrounds, we, we realized that... Um, whilst we were moving into a digital age, there were a lot of very specific processes that we were being left behind. And, and the concept of registered post is, is exactly one of those. Where, um, strange enough, the, the earliest record of, of a registered letter that we can find dates back to 1556, where the recipient had to leave a drop of blood with the messenger. You know, so the, the concept of registered letters has been around for a long time. But there was no, or we certainly couldn't find any kind of um, any kind of movement or, or, or any kind of intention to digi digitize that space. So um, we spent a lot of time and effort understanding local legislation, engaging with the right people to be able to launch uh, registered email and, and registered SMS. So that was back in, in 2016. Uh, <laughs> we then started learning hard lessons about how the industry actually works. Um, so we, we had great plans of, of just being able to walk into the industry and getting user adoption straight away. But that took, uh, it took a long time, Rob. Um, but uh, over the last five years, we, we, we've grown into a nice size company. And as I said, our flagship products are registered email and, and, and registered SMS. Um, time permitting, we might whet your appetite with a, a, a couple of the other very specific um, traditionally paper-based processes that we, we uh, are in the process of, of digitizing as add-on products. Norman, tell us specifically about those two products, the, the registered email and the registered SMS. Um, if you could just elaborate a little bit on those two offerings for us. Yeah, sure, Rob. Um, so, so effectively, what we do is we allow you to send your registered letter electronically and we give you two electronic channels to do that, either email or, or SMS. Um, so all of you out there, you, you would know your customer base or your target audience. Uh, you, you'd know the, um, the penetration rates of uh, mobile versus email availability. Um, you would all have your existing communication strategies as to how best you want to get hold of your customers. And, um, and more recently, those are turning to, to things like social media and WhatsApp chats and, and, and IVRs and, and those, those, fancy, those fancy channels. Um, but we let you make use of the good old SMS channel and an email channel in order to send out your, your registered letters. And it's really up to, up to you to decide which channel is, is the better one to use. Um, and a lot of that comes down to really two things. One, the one is um, availability of the channel. Does the consumer have an email address that you know is, is valid? Um, and, and the other one is the, the richness of the experience. So we know that uh, you can send out a lot more content by an email channel than you can as opposed to an SMS channel. Um, but the SMS channel, especially as we move into the, the lower LSMs, the SMS channel is still an incredibly effective method of getting um, really any kind of communication to a customer. I mean, let's face it, everybody um, even, and, and maybe sort of uh, monitor yourself through this. 
during this chat, if your phone vibrates, what do you do? I promise you, if your phone vibrates, the first thing you do is you grab it and, and, and you look at it. Um, so SMS, whether we think it's an atrium channel or not, it's, it's incredibly effective as in, in getting notices to the attention of a, of a customer or consumer. And Norman, how do you simulate the, in, in, in a paper-based world, you would have a proof of, of um, receipt where the guys actually would fetch the, the, the document. How, how do you deal with that? How do you provide a, a receipt and what does it contain? Right, so with, without going into the gory uh, technical detail, um, one of the, obviously, yes, the, the proof of delivery, delivery notification, registration certificate, they, they, they're all synonyms for really the same thing. The, it's the document that if you're preparing a court pack, that proof of delivery needs to be in, in your court pack um, in, in order to proceed with the matter. So first and foremost, we have to produce that, um, that, that document. The technical gory details associated with that, you know, we've got a great piece of um, legislation to paraphrase it, and I'm sure there'll be questions about um, sort of asking for this in more detail, but to paraphrase it, uh, even an electronic registered letter must still go through the post office. So, so we've we completed all of the, the, the required technical integration with the, with, the, with the South African post office in, in order to be able to provide the service. But the, the track and trace report, Rob, it, it contains all the details that, that need to be contained, plus a little bit more. What I mean by that is, for those of us who received a registered letter uh, recently or had a look at a SOPA track and trace report from the paper-based option, it's got to contain certain details. It's got to have a unique identifier, you know, the little barcode. It's got to have um, all the details about who sent the letter. It's got to have all the details about the, the recipient. Uh, date and timestamps as to when the letter was sent, when it was received. Um, and and we, so, so our, our registration certificates contain all of, that, all of that detail. We then go a step further in that we, because everything's electronic, we are also able to confirm the contents of that letter. What I mean by that is in the paper world, if I take a piece of paper and I put it inside an envelope and I lick and stick, nobody other than me knows what's actually inside that, that envelope. Um, so picture the scenario of a, um, a, a, a perennial debtor who's ducking and diving. You know, they might say, they'll pull out every excuse in the book. They might say, yes, you sent me a registered letter, but it was empty. There was nothing in the envelope, whatever the case may be. In the digital world, uh, in both email and SMSs, we can prove, we, we also prove the contents of, of that message and we embed that into the certificate. So in the email space, the body of the email, or the subject line, the body of the email, and all the attachments get embedded into the, the certificate as well. And in the SMS space, um, it's, it's the body of the SMS, as well as any document links that you, you may have added to that, that SMS. So, so really, the, the proof of delivery goes further than just who sent it, who received it, but we take it to the next level as to what was sent and what was received. And, and as far as an email is concerned, a registered email, so you can track delivery. Can you track whether it is actually open? You know, so, so this is functionality we used to have, and then we turned it off and we're considering turning it back on, um, et, et cetera. Um, the, and, and, and we're not sure. We, maybe we should run a little poll or something here, you know, get some, get some feedback. Is a read receipt uh, really important? What we... What, what we have found um, is, is that the, the methodologies we employ all, almost negate the, the reason for a, or, or the requirement for a read receipt. What I mean by that, um, when we send a, a registered email or a registered SMS um, and generate the track and trace report, what we also do is, is we then distribute that track and trace report, obviously to the sender, but also to the recipient. So now imagine that you're on the receiving end of a, a registered email or, or a registered SMS. You receive the notice, and then you also receive the track and trace report. So it, it creates that scenario of, I know that you know that, I know that you know that the message has, has been sent. Um, and, and what that does is, and we, we hear this from, from really all of our customers, is, is that the, the activation rates on the back of these registered emails and registered SMSs goes through the roof. 
Uh, so your, the recipients of the notices proactively try and do something. They proactively get hold of you um, in order to do whatever they need to do, make, it, make a plan, uh, payment arrangement, settle, debt review, whatever the, the, the case may be. Um, and, and on the back of that kind of feedback, we, we, we sort of think to ourselves, well, how important is, is a read receipt? Um, if you take the generalized problem statement uh, out of, um, just looking at a lot of these names here, Robin, out of your space from a software provider and, and, from, and from your customers, the generalized problem statement is, I just want my customer to make a plan. I want them to contact me and I want them to do something. Um, the last thing you want to do is, is go and litigate against, against these guys. It's expensive, it's time consuming, et cetera. However, if your customer proactively phones you and makes a plan, then, then that's kind of the, the, the job done. Um, and the, what we found is that the, the read receipts weren't necessarily adding that kind of value. Um, and, and that's why I'll go out to the audience here. Do you think read receipts are, are valuable? Yes or no? Um, and its functionality we, we can turn back on, but by far the biggest value that, that we found um, is the, the customer activations and the customer responses purely because of the way that we, we manage the, the, the track and trace reports. I can imagine that you've got to think a little bit out of the box. You can use it not just for section 129s and letters of demands, but you can use it for staff notifications. You can use it for summonses. But I guess the summons probably wouldn't be enforceable. Um, so on the first part of that, you, you can absolutely use this for, for anything. You can use this for uh, any use case where you just want that little bit more assurance that your message has, has gone through. Um, so uh, HR notices is, is, is a big space. So there isn't a registered letter requirement on an HR notice. But if, if one of your staff members takes you to the CCMA, uh, you've got to be at the first question that the CCMA is going to ask you is, show me how you sent Betty the, the notices. You know, show me how you, you told her when the disciplinary hearings were, were going to take place, et cetera. So, so HR, Rob, I think is a, is a good example of what, of what you say there. You can use it in, in any, kind of, um, any kind of scenario. Summons, is, Rob, is, is an incredibly interesting one um, because that's one of the, the new use cases we, we're looking to, to launch. So um, we, we have, we, we've gone, we've got to go down the legal routes and get all these opinions. So, so we've got um, senior council opinions that, believe it or not, it is possible for a sheriff to serve a summons electronically. Um, it seems like our biggest blocker is with the sheriffs themselves. Um, and I, I can't, I don't, I won't recognize all these names on, on the screen that I can see. And I hope that, that if there are some, some sheriffs here or, or, or representation, then, then I'm not going to offend them any, in any way. But right now, there isn't a mechanism for a sheriff to bill for the delivery of this notice. So think about that schedule that the sheriffs can bill you, you know, the urgent deliveries and the repeat deliveries and so on and so forth. There isn't a, a mechanism for them to, to, to bully for them, um, for, for an electronic notice. So the, the methodology is, is there, the legal opinion arguably um, is, is that this, this is possible. Uh, guys like yourselves have got those, um, the, those feature riff rich uh, sheriff modules uh, helping your customer base manage the documentation to and from sheriffs, et cetera. All of that's, all of that's in place. Um, there's just this, this last little piece of the puzzle that doesn't want to, or we're finding it very difficult for it to, to fall into, into play. I mean, we've even engaged with some of the sheriffs who, who, um, who are, are scared to travel into certain areas because it's dangerous. So if they had digital options uh, from a personal safety perspective or to avoid um, personal safety incidents, you know, they, they love that concept. Um, but there's just that little nuance that, 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 uh, that isn't falling into place around how does a sheriff actually build this? But, but still, you could use it as a, as a strategy to activate certain accounts. Oh, very definitely. Very definitely. Um, you, you know, so, so if... 
if you want to send out a, a summons or a letter that's um, got the heading of summons, you know, we don't decide that. that that's part of you as, as a customer. It, it's part of your strategy. You know, our role, and, I, and maybe I should have led with this, our role is the registering agent. Um, we have to uh, remain as a third party witness to the communication that happens. And it sounds like a mouthful, but you send your letters to your customers and, and, and we just sit in the middle and we uh, monitor, audit, verify, confirm what was sent between party A and party B. So if you want to send a letter with the heading um, final demand 129, you can do that. If you want to then, for the next letter, if you want to change that to summons, you can do that as, you can do that as well. Um, and we have heard that there, there are people that, that, that um, are, are quite clever in how they make letters look more serious. You know, the use of red font versus black and you know, all, the, all those subtle nuances. Um, but the, the, the point I'm making there is, is that as, as a customer, uh, you dictate what, what you send. We just give you the, sure. the distribution channel. Norman, we've got a number of attorneys here with us today. Um, <laughs> and I think all of them want to know how enforceable um, would these notices be in a court of law? Um, so, very. <laughs> the detail. Um, we got our, our first matter through a lower court uh, in the beginning of 2018. Um, between then and now, uh, we know of um, sort of over a hundred lower courts that uh, that accept our, or hundred lower court judges that that accept our stuff. When I say our stuff, they accept the digital service of of, of registered post. More recently, we we've had various cases in um, the Johannesburg and then the Pretoria High Courts as well, um, where. Some people say the matters have been tested, others say that they haven't been tested, et cetera. Um, but we, we've had at least three different judges that we know of um, sort of have a, a good look at, at the digital channels and then still grant the relevant case um, in, in favor of the, of the, of the plaintiffs. Um, the, the other thing that we, we do know is that everybody has their own kind of requirements. So when we, when we first started the business and for example, we'd approach the banks, um, the, the bank said, go get a court case. So we went and we got a court case, you know, court approval of, of the digital channel. And then when, uh, when we did that, then they changed their minds and said, um, well, now you need something else. And now you need something else and now you need something. Else. So, so the list of requirements is, is, is always changing. What I can say is that uh, we've even got a high court, a high court ruling where, where the judge has ordered the plaintiff to serve notices via registered post, but serve them electronically, and went as far as to mention that the, the plaintiff must use RegCom to serve those notices electronically in compliance with the ECT Act, and actually spelled out, yeah, you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, from our perspective, that, 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 that's, um, that is worthwhile. Um, from, from a, maybe looking at it from another angle, um, you know, we've got a customer who said that they've had, again, again an EDC that operates countrywide. Um, and they said last year they, they litigated on 400 different, or four, 400 different matters all over, the, all over the country and they didn't have a single problem with any. Um, you know, and that's feedback we get. Rob, the, uh, the, the, my only suggestion is if, if there are any concerns around the legalities and, and um, over the last five years, we, we, we've had very, very detailed conversations, you know, so down to what the 12-6 the uh, supporting affidavits need to say, uh, or, or should say, just to, just to help the process. And we had one question on, on whether those um, judgments can be made available for, for the delegates to have a look at. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, they're, they're public documents. What I would suggest is we'll, we'll, we can just email it to, to all the delegates afterwards and they can have Perfect. a look at it. Perfect. Um, Norman, tell us a little bit about the costing of, um, 
uh, I, I know there's a whole lot of hidden costs when you do a paper-based letter of demand. There's printing costs, there's driving off to the post office, there's envelope costs. Um, yeah. You know, chat to us a little bit about the costing of your solutions. Yeah. Rob, we, we charge a stock standard uh, transaction fee, a click fee. One, one letter equals, equals one fee. Our, um, our standard price is 18 Rand 50 a letter. So the first point of relativity there is what does the paper letter cost from a direct OPEX perspective? Um, and you know, some of the audience might know more specifically than me. I think a letter is around 33 Rand, somewhere around there at the moment um, in the paper-based world. So straight away, there's a, a 15 Rand a letter. It's almost a 40% saving um, going electronic versus, versus paper. Rob, then you very rightly add in all, all the, the additional costs. So aside from the, the paper and the, the printing, um, et cetera, there's the factor of time. Um, yeah, I, I, I would love to ask, but I certainly won't ask the audience typically how long it takes for a, a paper-based registered letter to be, to be delivered. And, and then how does that affect you know, the process that follows? You know, so if you're waiting 14 days for a, a paper-based letter to be delivered, it means your whole process is typically delayed by another 14 days. Um, and of course, the reliability issue. All, all that too, you know, reliability. So, so how many of those letters get returned uh, and delivered? Um, in the digital world or in the registered email and registered SMS world, everything happens at the speed of, a, of an email or an SMS. Um, when it comes to contactability, we, we know that uh, it's easier to trace somebody's mobile number and email address than it is their, their physical address. So delivery rates uh, improve. Um, and uh, so you take the, 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 you take the improvement in uh, timing and the improvement in delivery rates and the reduction in, in direct OPEX costs. It's a, we believe it's a pretty compelling value proposition. Fantastic. Um, what I would like to do, Norman, is I'd actually like to walk our delegates through what it would actually look like in practice um, from an Excalibur point of view. So I've gone and shared um, my screen and I just want to walk you guys through this. So first of all, let's have a look at the activation process. So step one, you're going to sign up with Norman. Um, sign, decide whether you want to sign up for SMS or for registered emails. And once you've done that, Norman will provide us with a client number. You will then decide what templates you want to activate and you'll log a ticket with Excalibur and we would then activate those templates for you. All right. Um, so some of our clients on Excalibur 3, some of them on, on 4. So <laughs> if you haven't seen the screen before, you're one of our newer clients, then you've only been on Excalibur 4. So registered emails you'd be doing through PAM down there. And you would have, you'll see, I've actually got an example here of an email summons that we were playing around with. You would set it up, and once you press next in PAM, and it queues that document, you'd actually get the notification that has been dealt with, as well as the document that's been saved into your imaging bank. Um, as you all know, when you send an email, you get a little email shortcut on the history notes of the document that you've sent. And this is where you will have a shortcut to your certificate, um, the certificate that you've actually sent the document. So in short, this is what it looks like. So that's page one of Regcom's certificate. Um, you can see here in the middle where my mouse is over, and you can actually see the send date and the delivery date. And we've now grayed out the, the information, but you can clearly see that it's got a unique ID. It's got a, the email addresses that it's come from, that it's gone to, and there's page two and page three. And there's the content that, that Norman spoke about. Right. Um, SMSs work similar. You've got to go and create your template and then you've got to activate it so that you don't accidentally send anything via registered communication. Um, different to the emails, you can do it one by one or in bulk, where the registered emails currently are only in bulk. 
Well, you can do one by one, but it's going to go via PAM. Um, you'll also click the registered SMS um, a choice, and then similar to the email process, you would have the, the feedback saved onto your imaging bank and also um, available to have a look at. So this certificate looks very similar to the previous one. It just refers to registered SMS. And we've actually taken a screenshot of a registered SMS that's come through here. And that's what it looks like. All right. So if we jump forward to Excalibur 4, um, it looks really similar. You've got, um, you'll go to PAM, you'll select your, your option for registered email, um, press next, it will generate it, make the, um, the copies into your history note, and then update your, your history notes with those, with those shortcuts. Again, there we have the certificates, document that was sent, and you can actually see here at the top, it actually shows the email that was received in the inbox of, of the recipient. Here we go with the SMSs, you've got to activate them first, select the choice you want to make, select your, your content, which would be over there, and there's your history note with the content. Right. So in short, that's literally how easy it is to make that work. Um, so, has anybody got any questions to Norman how it works, or anybody have any questions to me how the activation would work, or anything like that? Everyone happy? Um, so, uh, uh, we're a little bit over our time. I think let's leave it at that. What we're going to do, um, once we're done with this, we're going to send you Norman's contact details to every single delegate. And if you want to chat with him, chat with him, sign up with him, Norman would let us know. Suresh, yes, you asked something. No, no, sorry. Um, Norman, you mentioned something about the post office still being involved. So does a letter still have to be sent by the post office? Or maybe just elaborate on, on that a bit. So the way I understand it, the law says the post office must do the registered delivery. And Norman's gone along, Regcom's gone along and registered with the post office to register it. So oh, now okay. you no longer need... Norman, did I summarize? Uh, it's a, a perfect summary. Uh, Suresh, the technical detail is a clause 19.4 of the ECT Act. Uh, but to, to summarize it, the post office still needs to be involved, et cetera. The, um, the, the one thing that we've managed to do uh, from a continuity perspective is separate our technical environment from post offices, business as usual environment, so that if they're on strike or anything like that, then, then our services are, are still able to operate. Thank you so much. Um, Hello. Will this be available in Botswana? Uh, yes, Samantha, the service is available globally because it, it's a digital, a digital service. Um, the last time we engaged with Botswana, um, your comms regulatory authority, I think they're called BOCRA, uh, they had one or two things that they needed to, needed to sort out. But um, right now, the service is, is available to anybody who has an, an internet connection and wants to send notices to an email address or, or a mobile number. Um, and if nothing else, you can use the service from an activation perspective to, again, because of that whole, I know that you know the I know that you know scenario from your, your, your customers um, and, and, and start improving your internal processes that way. Awesome. Hey, you've got, have you got another question? Yes, Rob. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I just, is there any piece of enabling legislation regarding the registered com? The secondly is that normally, according to my understanding, when you do uh, electronic uh, communication between two parties, both parties have to agree to that. That's how far I know it in terms of the the, the law society rules or any regarding the, the att attorneys. Some of the attorneys can confirm that. Both parties must agree to say, no, we can send uh, communicate via electronically 
is there any kind of legislation that enables that to, to happen in terms of the, 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 what has Norman just uh, alluded? Um, absolutely, Albert, uh, you, you, you're spot on with everything that you, you say, um, but none of it prevents uh, this all from taking place. So as I mentioned to Suresh, there's, there's a provision in the ECT Act, Clause 19.4, that allows registered posts to be electronic. Uh, first and foremost. The second part of it, Albert, if, if you, well, now you're going to test me here, but I think it's uh, Uniform Rules of Court, uh, Rule 4, I think, is, is all about um, the recipient consenting to receive a notice. And, and I'm, I've, I've paraphrased that as, as well. Um, but yes, you, you absolutely need consent. The way we view it, um, when, whenever we asked to uh, consult on this, is that when you are signing an original agreement, uh, think about any kind of agreement that, that you've signed, not necessarily a credit agreement, but any kind of agreement, uh, typically there's a clause that's included for your domicilia. And by default, people give a physical address as, as a domicilia. Of late, um, most service providers have been expanding that domicilia to include uh, digital detail. So to include an email address and to include a, a mobile number. Um, and that is to cater for the ability to send electronic notices. If then finally, as, as, your, as the, the catch all, if that's not in place, you, you and your call centers, et cetera, you always have the ability to update an agreement. So, so let's say that um, I've only given a physical address as a, as a domicilia. Your call center can phone me, verify who I am. You know, Hi, Norman, how are you doing? Norman, please can you confirm your, your latest email address because we want to send notices to, to that address. And as soon as I've confirmed the email address, that uh, effectively becomes an addendum to the original contract and you have your consent in place and you can, you, you can operate uh, electronically. And consent can probably be implied. Um, <laughs> uh, Judging by what's happening in the poppy space right now, consent can definitely be implied. Our, our view is make consent as explicit as possible because um, if you're dealing with uh, tricky matters, you, you, you don't want a, a petty item to, to be holding you down. So, um, you know, we've got, we know of a few call centers who um, are busy updating details, those consent details for the bank for the banks, the, the original, the credit card or the VAT type, type agreement. So they um, tracing the, the customers, as I'm sure most of you guys do already, but tracing the latest, greatest details uh, and then updating um, credit agreements as an example for, for the banks. But they're asking specific questions um, really to be sure that, yeah, if you catch a judge on a bad day, then the judge doesn't say, oh, I'm not really so sure about this. Perfect. Norman, we've had a request um, for some marketing material. Have you got a PowerPoint or a video clip that we could send off to, to our delegates? Yeah, absolutely, Rob. I'll, I'll share that with you and the team, and um, you guys can, can distribute that. We'll distribute it then. Perfect. Um, we've run <laughs> ooh, 15 minutes over our time slot. Um, is there perhaps one last question, or shall we? Switch off. Everyone happy? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. We hope you, you found this enriching. We really appreciate your time. We'll send off all the uh, um, those court cases, Norman's contact details, and some marketing material for you guys to, to, to work through at your own time. Perfect. Norman, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Rob, thank you. Thank and you. Uh, to everybody out there, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.